So uh, we gonna All right. we gonna deal so, we gonna deal out some monkey business now. <laughs> that was the working title for the show. <laughs> Actually, it, it did have a working title, and it was called Three Bean. But then Cartoon Network was like, "That sounds like a salad." <laughs> And, and Joe Murray show. was just like, that's the joke, but okay. And Cartoon Network's like, that, it's not good. I mean, we're having this conversation, so evidently it's not a great goof. <laughs> Joseph. Okay. <It's> three <laughs> like, television executives just speak to them like they're their fucking mom. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Murray. <laughs> Joseph David Murray. Do you even know that's his little name? I just looked, brought up his Wikipedia page. <laughs> okay, the, uh... <laughs> a split second before I spoke that sentence. Thank God. God forbid that negligible goof was inaccurate. Okay, so Camp Laszlo. So, as I said at the top of the show, uh, Joe Murray is also the creator of the uh, better-remembered 90s cartoon, uh, Rocko's Modern Life, uh, which was made at, a, at, like, a different era in television, children's animation, so it was a very different show. Uh, and I think that was to Camp Laszlo's detriment, uh, but more on that later. Now, just a history of uh, this show's production. Um, so, growing up, uh, Joe Murray attended summer camp uh, for about four or five years in a row every summer, uh, but he said he couldn't really get the scouting thing down, but he has a lot of fond memories uh, from his times at summer camp, and uh, also fond memories of early early uh, Bugs Bunny or even Yogi Bear cartoons, anything with like a calming, the, the, those nice colorful, naturey backgrounds when the cartoons take place in forests and stuff, obviously mm-hmm. emulated uh, here. And uh, he, he had a belief that uh, the cartoons at the time, I guess early to mid-2000s, were uh, a lot more, like, f- like futuristic and all that stuff, and he wanted to he wanted to create a series that uh, got back to nature. Yeah. So, these, obviously. These all dang this. kids with their cartoons are too hip. <laughs> yeah, uh, that... <laughs> They're too hip and flashy. B- based on the ads... I don't like them. Based on the ads... And uh, little banner things uh, playing on the versions of the show I watched. A lot of that was like it was like Ben Ten was just starting, and like a bunch of other stuff that I forgot existed. And even Kids Next Door had yeah. a lot of sci-fi elements to it. Yeah, yeah. They like they lived in a tree fort that was like forty percent tree. The rest of it was like a boat and a fighter jet. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so and they well, did. Originally, he, originally... They literally went to space at one point, didn't they? <laughs> Oh, multiple points. Oh, they have That's a base the, on the moon. That's, That's where the store's correct. headquarters is on the moon. Of yeah. Of course it is. How could I forget? Made of, like, stapled together out of garbage. <laughs> 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 but anyway. <laughs> the reason why Tooch is taking the, he- the helm on this is because you have been a huge fan of Joe Murray for a while, right? Um, well, I mean, like... Don't you love his book? I'm a huge... Fan and his his he he wrote a he wrote a really great book, uh, creating animated cartoons with character, and it's not and it's not really one of those how to draw books and it's not really one of those like textbook animation guides and it's not even one of those like you know like what are comics as a theory <laughs> bullshit or whatever. It's just it just explains to you how the fuck a cartoon goes from being an idea in some schmuck's bar napkin to. <laughs> being something they're producing on television and and it, and, it, and it gives you it gives you not like horribly in depth but a, but a really different perspective like it, like it shows you like a lot of like di- various like worksheets and paperwork and like sheets showing the like when they're working on multiple episodes per season like 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 what are you doing today well today we're working on the voice work for this episode and the backgrounds for this episode and the script for this episode and all yeah. it's all going at once and it's all a giant factory process that only a handful of people have to run and maintain and it's just like it, it just gives it just gives a really interesting insight that not a lot of other quote unquote like necessary to read books for cartoons and animation and comics like really have so I, mm. I I always highly recommend it, and and obviously he goes into Laszlo and Rocco a little bit, and because that's what he, you know, that's spent what his he career did. doing. Yeah, but he also like has little. He also has interviews with like different uh, other cartoonists and stuff, like little single page blurbs from various people who also work on stuff. I think uh, Tom Warburton and I think someone for SpongeBob and someone like that. I don't know. I I left the book on the other side of the ocean. I gotta yeah. talk to Martin about that. 
Oh no. Like I started um, taking an animation history class this semester, so that might be a good thing to pick up. Oh yeah, totally. I uh, for dude, it's 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 just great to read even if you're not planning on going into animation, but just if you love animation, like this is like I said, it's it's a perspective that isn't often talked about. Yeah. Um but uh so Back to uh, Camp Lazarus production. He originally envisioned this as a as a children's book series, but uh, the idea sort of just grew too big, and he was like, "This guy can't now." Uh, so he called up uh, Linda Semensky, who worked on Marie with Rocco, uh, to to get a new series going, and uh, obviously uh, she supported him as she always did. And um, then when they got when they got Cartoon Network to uh, give him the go ahead, uh, he he brought. Uh, Mark O'Hare is a co-producer. Basically, like most of the Camp Laszlo production crew was people he worked on with Rocco, because he's a he's very much the kind of guy to be like these people. I worked with these people before. New people, they no. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who the fuck these guys are. Well, no, it's like you call- know, I've I've had a working relationship with these people. I know their their deal. I know how to work with yeah. them. I know I like them. Call like when you. It's very much like the sequel to a heist film. You know, you got to get the band back together. One last ride. <laughs> yeah, and Five I mean, frankly, times. making a cart, making a completed cartoon or any television show, but I feel especially animation, making it all the way to airing it on television is so fucking crazy. It's basically like robbing the Pentagon. <laughs> yes, if you've done that once, then you are officially like nobody can talk shit on you if you've managed to get something to air. Uh, Pretty much, I didn't know that Lasso was originally conceived a, as a book, but that makes sense because I'm. He, between Rocco and Laszlo, he took a break from animation for a bit, as I imagine a lot of people do, because it's hard. Yes. And yeah. uh, he just wrote some kids' books. Who Asked the yeah. Moon to Dinner and The Enormous Mr. Schmupsy in 1999 and 2003. Oh. Oh. Yeah, he, he said that the characters were just, they had too much. He couldn't contain them in a book. They need, they to, need live. to move. And you can buy. I'm looking at that Amazon listing. You can write. You can buy creating animated cartoons with character for as low as uh, thirteen sixty nine. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. That's a good price because it's a thick book. Like I have. A, I have. I have a paperback and it's thick as fuck. Uh, the show began in two thousand and four and ended in two thousand and seven. Um. During that period of cartoons, which a lot of people, especially fellow '90s shitheads like us, um, consider something of a dark age, and looking back, that's bullshit, but... It's I more do... of a mad age. Yeah, it's like, there was absolutely great stuff that was happening at that time. Uh, you know, there's Kids Next Door, uh, I think Ed and Eddie was still running... Uh, oh yeah. Oh, what Billy I mean, what Mandy. I mean was like there were there were no there were no new premiere shows from that era. Everything that was still running back from like pre early two thousands, like pre pre like two thousand four two thousand three. Yeah, it was just uh, continuing. Was it was just more of the shows. It wasn't like any brand new show that like broke the envelope or whatever. I think yeah. maybe Ben Ten, but like that was its kind of own thing. Yeah, Ben Ten was Ben. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, Ben like, 10 fit very well into that time period. Yeah. It was honestly, like, the Ben 10, th- that first series of Ben 10, it was honestly a solid a solid show. Like, I have nothing bad to say about Ben 10. That, that's my understanding of the show, but um, I don't know anybody who's actually watched it. I like Everybody in my circle was too old for that kind of thing, but, but you know, it worked for a lot of kids, you know, merchandise-wise. It moved toys. Yeah, but I'm so looking many at toys. I'm ten looking at, alien toys. Oh, he got more than ten. They they threw away with that, that concept. It like was halfway ten through the show. At the be- launch, ten toys at the launch. That's great. I'm looking at the other Cartoon Network shows that premiered in 2005, and it was uh, Life and Times of Juniper Lee, My Gym Partner's a Monkey, and Ben Ten. So yeah, those didn't really go anywhere except for Ben Ten. Yeah, Ben Ten. And, like, before, the one before that was, like, Hi Hi Puffy, I'm a Yumi. Ah, uh, yep. After Ben Ten was Squirrel Boy and Class of 3000, Out of Jimmy's Head. That one I've never even heard of. Yeah, it's those a live, are the... It's sh- a live action show. Oh. Yeah, those are the shows that you would watch in between, like, the core shows. When you just had time to burn watching cartoons. And you're like, yeah. well, it's... 
the new, I don't know, the new Spongebob isn't on until, like, six. Like, let's go over to Cartoon Network and watch whatever the heck they have going on in the middle of the day, which is this kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the thing about Laszlo, which I think we all agree with, it's, I would say it's good, but not great. Yeah. Yeah, I would say the same. I th- I, th- I think it's solid. It I think did that... its job very well. Yeah, I think that for what it is, it's uh, very successful. I think there's some good stuff in it. I just think um, it's nothing especially fantastic. And I think, too, you said you were going to come back to the, uh, comparing it to Rocco's Modern Life. Rocco's Modern Life, for better or for worse, was very memorable. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it was it... just, it was weird. I don't even know where that world took place in. It was, it's crazy, it was like a print come to life with weird animal people. And also the the tone, well the tone, and the tone was very much of its era uh, when Joe Murray pitched it like the, the, the Nickelodeon executives came at him with the hopes of repeating their success with Ren and Stimpy. They said, you know, Ren and Stimpy, it's tapping a demographic we never thought we could really reach before, you know, a lot of the older teens and the college kids even. It, it's so people you, on drugs. We need to make more of that. And yeah, honestly, in so many words, yes. And he and he he talks about this in the book, and, and he said because a lot of people were coming at him like, oh, you know, like man, I can't believe uh, you got this past the radar. I can't believe you know the executives and whatnot. Like the man let you get away with this. And Joe Murray's just like, the man told me to make the cartoon like this, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and the only reason, like the only reason th- in the later half of Rocco's career that there was a backlash because after so many years of Nickelodeon going with that model, all the toy advertisers on their network kind of stopped and went, hey, if you guys keep freaking making shows for not children, <laughs> we're not going to be able to push any of these toys where like we're paying you to advertise so uh stop <laughs> and joe murray like the, the paraphrasing but almost a good quote like the exact same executives that were telling me to push the uh, to push the adult stuff were now telling me to like reel it back and so it was very it was a very like tumultuous later half of the show hmm. but now uh, cuz i feel like cuz now like this show on card network it's very much for just by the books, it's a nice, fun, cute kids show, and this being only the second thing he's ever done uh, on television, I feel like a lot of his, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, fans, if 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 in that point in history, singular cartoonists had fans back then uh, that weren't like just fucking Walt Disney, um, th- there was like a backlash. There was like, you know, this isn't Rocco. What is this? Yeah. And it's like, like it's it's something else, dude. Yeah, like Go watch Rocco. He said that, you know, he based it, like, he wanted to appeal to younger children because of his experience having his own kids. And he said that having kids actually helped him understand, like, what do kids find funny or fun? Maybe I shouldn't so- put a big jerk-off cartoon in my cartoon. A big jerk-off <laughs> joke in my cartoon. Looking jokey chickens. In yeah. every episode of my cartoon, there's, like, a different one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe like, I shouldn't have one of my main characters take a dump on the other's lawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was very much had kids in mind. Like it started as a kid's book. It came from his childhood fond memories. It has a very sleepy kind of style to it. It watching it almost feels like, you know, spending those long summer days doing like nothing, just trying to find something to do. It's almost invoked in the whole feel of the show. The music and the characters. Um, I actually got a pretty big uh, SpongeBob vibe out of it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. In, in terms of its energy and also music. Mm-hmm. Well, part of that was because a lot of the SpongeBob music is actually non-licensed, so a lot of cartoons at the era use that those same unlicensed sound bits and music bits. Yeah, but also, but like Lazlo was mostly banjo. Yeah. Yeah, I, like, I think of more banjo with Camp Laszlo. But like, I remember, yeah, SpongeBob uh, did have like a lot of open source stuff. I remember that song from Jellyfish Jam is like Arena Number Two is the official name of that song. Yeah, it's like, it, nice. it's like an off-brand. Y'all ready for this? Yeah, <laughs> the score was composed by Andy Paley. 
He featured original camp songs, bluegrass, cowboy swing. They would often use things like washboards and the musical saw, as well as utilizing tracks from the associated production music library. So, there you go. So, do we want to get into, like, uh, maybe characters? Because this show had a pretty good voice cast. It Great definitely vo- did, yeah. Because Murray, um, he hired a lot of, like, not just voice actors, but, like, comedy people. Like, stand-up comics and sketch actors. Like, he just wanted people who were funny. Yeah, because that's, that's how he cast Rocco back in the day. Back before really cartoon, like, good cartoon voice acting had really become, like, its own kind of career. You had to, like... You had to come up with something clever if you wanted any kind of original, you know, performances. And back in the day, bef- before before Tom Kenny, uh, before Tom Kenny was a, a voice actor for his living, he was like a comedian, like an, an improv person and a stand-up. And Carlos uh, Carlos Alizraki, who voiced uh, who voiced Rocco and Laszlo, uh, all st- still does stand-up like today. Uh, so what? So yeah, they're, they're it, both great. Wasn't Rocco? Um... Kenny's first major voice role. Heifer was his first voice role, yeah, and uh, and and yeah, that's. And then he's been in every, and then since then he's been in every cartoon. Literally all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so the characters are kind of fun because uh, Murray gave each one of them like a background, even if it's not necessarily one that's explored in the show. Like I didn't know this from when I watched the show as a kid, but not only is Laszlo a Brazilian spider monkey. But his family is actually from Brazil, and originally, conceptually, Murray wanted him to be, like, in, like actually born in Brazil and moved to the States and have a Brazilian accent. But the producers were like, look, you can only have one main character with an accent. You can't have two. And he was like, okay, I guess Raj then, not Laszlo? <laughs> Yeah, that blows. Wow. That would be great. Yeah, so he was gonna... So he kind of retconned it to say that, like, his parents moved to the United States to start a fruit company. Um, where They were originally from Sao Paulo, and Lazo was born in the States, which is why he knows English so well. And But, like, he had this whole story... <laughs> It, it, it's, it's like just... this is how people write D and D characters. They have this whole thing that never comes <laughs> up because everybody plays D and D the same way, as an opportunistic mercenary. <laughs> so, I, 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 apparently, when he was creating Laszlo himself, he thought of the personality first before the monkey. Like he, he was just thinking of this optimistic, lighthearted, free-thinking, silly, like energetic kind of character and like he just thought the spider monkey perfect which i lo- also love how every animal in the show is a very specific species of animal it's not just yeah. like monkey slug it's like no it's a banana slug it's a fucking albino pygmy rhino thank you very much like you're welcome it's kind of interesting because apparently there was a um like a press book that was released for the show that had like all the original con the press kit is like was publicly released so like all the original concepts of the characters are like available and you can oh. kind of see how it's different than what they turned out to be like there are huh. some characters that like a very different um i think laszlo was the same more or less but like Characters like Edward was originally going to be like a stickler for the rules and like all this kind of weird different stuff. So it's just another way to show you that like in making a show, things just kind of take a life of their own and become not exactly what you intended them to be. Yeah, that 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 kind of stuff is really interesting to see because, you you know, you know, everything goes through that. Almost everything goes through that kind of uh, cycle, but you just don't see it because. I mean, it's such a, it it really is a nightmare labyrinth to get from conception to finished project with going through yeah. television. Uh, and especially something that is by necessity so collaborative like animation. Uh, mm-hmm. Everything's going to get smashed around a lot. And it's, I, I think tracing that path as like an archaeologist of animation is super interesting. But it's just, it's rare that you'll get to see all that. Yeah. Right. It's... 
It's and I feel like most of the time it's a good decision to not be as transparent with that kind of stuff because then we just have more of like and we've complained about this before of like people posting like concept art and designs and going like why doesn't it look like this <laughs> for a million reasons for one million reasons it doesn't look like that yeah but like, <laughs> like we we found out now that that Lazo was supposed to be you know more Brazilian he was supposed to have a Brazilian accent and now I'm disappointed that wasn't the case. Yeah, he was supposed to be born in Brazil and be, like, an immigrant kid. And he probably still would have been played cool. by Alizraki. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Because, um, you know, Carlos Alizraki. Originally, yeah. Lupus was going to be a horse. <laughs> Gasp. He, he could have been Bojack Horseman. Yeah, he would have been Bojack Horseman if he was a count, camp counselor. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, oh, Lupus. <laughs> Lumpus became my favorite act. Lumpus is um pretty unique for a Tom Kenny role. Because, uh, like, I don't know if I've mentioned this before. Tom Kenny's a, obviously a fantastic voice actor with a very wide range. But there's something about his voice where I can always immediately recognize him, more so than any other voice actor. Uh, there's just a... Yep. We, some quality in his voice I can hear it in every character he's ever done. But I've never heard a character that's he's done that sounds anything like this. And this sounds... I would say this character sounds the least like Tom Kenny out of any character of his I've heard, at least that I can think of off, off the dome right now. Yeah, it sounds like in like a background voice he would do, not like a main character yeah. voice. Like, he yeah. does these voices in other shows, but as, like, incidental characters or, like, narrators or random things in the background, but not as, like, forefront, like, this is the character, this is what they sound like yeah. all the time. Um, I, uh, the other thing I like about Tom Kenny in this show is that he's doing kind of a Harry Shearer thing, uh, in that he's playing two, he's playing two characters who are foils of each other and have a great dynamic. He plays both Lumpus and Slinkman. Uh, yeah, similar to... They, they, they have a great dynamic. Yeah. Similar oh, to... I love them. Similar to how Shearer does Burns and Smithers. There's actually a lot of that going on in this show. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, uh, it's a pretty small... Jeff Bennett is playing, like, five people. Yeah, Jeff Bennett's playing a lot of people, Doug Lawrence is playing two people, uh, Steve Little's playing a surprising amount of people. And th this was, uh, St where Steve Little got his voice acting started. He later went on to do voice acting in, um... Did he do voice acting in, in, uh, Flapjack? I mean, I know he's, you know, pep up in Adventure Time. Yeah, he was, a uh, he, oh, motherfucker, he was Dr. Barber in Lolly Poop Deck. <gasps> of course. Yeah, also Jill Talley and Jody Benson. Like, I think everybody on the show played more than one recurring character. Color Styles Rocky also voiced Chef McMuesley. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who I liked. Yeah, and, and of course Clam. Yeah. I, I bet he could knock out, like, the entire season in, like, 45 minutes. <laughs> it was always weird when, like, Laszlo wasn't around and they, when it, like... Because it was always when Clam was only one of, like, two or three people in the room and they needed him to say more stuff. Whenever he said a full sentence, it was always really weird. Yeah, there are yeah. certain characters who are like that. I uh, I saw a great tweet once from uh, Brennel Floss. It's like, can you imagine a long, sprawling interview with Cap'n Crunch? He's really <laughs> optimized for short phrases. I don't even know what he sounds like. I haven't seen a Captain Crunch commercial in so long. Me neither, actually. I assume it's, like, all Santa Clausy and deep and truly. Yeah. Oh, but, but very Santa know. Clausy. Or, like, uh, when I pre-ordered Super Mario Galaxy at GameStop, there was a thing where they called you to confirm the pre-order. There was a, like, pre-recorded thing from the voice of Mar Charles Martinet uh, telling you about the game. And it's, like, two minutes long. Of Mario talking too long. in complete no. sentences, it's. I would have hung up. It's insane. Wow. You can find it online. <laughs> I assume the sec. I assume it's opens with, "It's a me Mario." I b probably. <laughs> we were talking about clam. Like, what if he like phone pranked you, just like, "Hey, what's up?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, to get back to the point, uh, clam is absolutely like that. Clam shouldn't say more than I'm gonna say three words at a time, and it should yeah. be it should be a singular phrase. And he always repeats something that somebody had just said. Yeah, that was one of my favorite I think the lines. The longest thing he said was in the um, was in the Where's Laszlo special movie type deal. Did either of you get to see that one? No. It was sort of like they, they they it was it was a flashback to like the origin story, like when when the the jelly cabin first came to camp and met Aww. and turned it upside down. Oh, 
Yeah. Uh, so Raj and Clam are just sort of talking about like Laszlo. It's like they like Raj calls him really really weird, and Clam just goes, "Yeah, I guess he's kind of weird." <laughs> and I was like, "No." That had, like, syntax and everything. Shut up. <laughs> My favorite uh, uh, bit with that was, what did Raj say when when you told him you wanted to kick him out of the play? If you do that, we will... I'm not going to repeat. I'm not going to try to imitate Raj's accent. Jesus Christ. If you if you <laughs> kick Lazlo out of the play, we will qu- also quit in protest. And what did Clam say? He just repeated the last thing Raj said. Protest! Yeah, that sounded like him. <laughs> <laughs> I love Raj. He was always my favorite as a kid. Uh, I just loved listening to him. Like, yeah, right. he has every a really time great, he opened his a great mouth, voice. I was just like, wow, I want to listen to everything you're going to say because you're the best. I don't know. I loved how he liked marshmallows. I loved how he would use like really odd words that most people don't use all the time. And I think that is part of him being from India because like, I've read and like experienced that like Indians' approach to English is very different than in other countries. They'll use words like bamboozled and like <laughs> just like words people don't really use day to day. They'll use fun words that are yeah. good and interesting. Yeah, they'll use fun, cool words like that. And Raj would talk like that. They'll use bamboozle in a sentence where they intend to be taken seriously, which is just not a thing <laughs> in the Western Hemisphere. Exactly. That's what made Raj so great. I was like, he's saying all kinds. He just talks different, not just because of his accent. And Um, and you've always liked type A characters. Yeah, I have. And I like elephants and... They're your favorite animal. They are. And he's not as type A as other type A characters. He's a lot looser than some of the other ones that we've explored even on this show. Like... He is kind of more of a type A, a character, I guess. But I don't know. I just... He's just really fun. The, the, <laughs> I always the, loved him. My go-to example of you liking type A characters is always that your favorite was Blossom on PPG. Yeah, I'm like, my favorite was Blossom. I always sympathize with Rabbit on... Rabbit, Rabbit that's the other thing. That's yeah, what you like, said I was show. always like, defending kid, Rabbit. Like, Why doesn't everyone listen to Rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like and everybody else is like, man, Rabbit's a tool. <laughs> I mean, Raj is cautious and he's kind of timid and, you know, he's a little neurotic. But they're kind of all neurotic, so, I mean... They all have various neuroses. They all have various things. And he likes to have fun, though. Like, he's not a stick in the mud at all, which is different from a lot of type A characters. Like, he'll do irresponsible things a for lot. the sake of fun. Like, when they burnt all of 50 of Slinkman's dollars just riding that what are those things called? Those automated ride things in front of stores? The little yeah. wiggle rocket thing? Yeah, the wig- wiggle rockets. <laughs> the wiggle rocket. They spent like $50 on a wiggle rocket! They spent like $150 because they went back to him like three different times. Oh my god. <laughs> But, um, and, like, they take quarters. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did they write <laughs> they, they wrote it a lot. Oh. Oh, my God. My favorite character was Edward. Oh, Like, Edward. when I was, when I was looking for, like, the select, ep- like, which episodes to watch, because there was no way I was getting through all, like, five seasons. Uh, and you can do that. It's very episodic. Uh, it's probably the most episodic thing we've covered. And, uh... I found myself always wanting to watch the ones that were Edward centric because it was always. I feel like he was the only one that had any kind of semblance of like an arc, <laughs> in a way. He Even was though like they always the returned to the status quo. Yeah. Not, it was, yeah. Yeah. I I love the egg episode, <laughs> and I love that he has his doll Veronica. Veronica. <laughs> he's he's very funny. I love Edward yeah, too. Yeah, and, and he was voiced by a. Or who he's just known by Mr. Lawrence, or Doug, who was the voice of, uh, yeah, Plankton and uh, Filbert from Rocco's Modern Life, and, and a bunch also, of other characters. Also, in Nurse show. Leslie and David Ping Pong on this show. Oh, I love yeah. Nurse Leslie. Nurse Leslie is the best. Because <laughs> <laughs> Nurse Leslie's entire character is based on when you go to the doctor and they're just sitting on the chair scooting around. <laughs> that was the idea behind the character. Just Bennett. those little leg kicks. Just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I, I just love oh. how flat and deadpan his voice is. Because Lawrence has such a great voice to for that. The, obviously, he's great at being like a screaming asshole like Plankton or, or Edward, but like, he's also really good at this. Yeah, oh my gosh. Uh, and then um, Bennett's other major recurring character is uh, Samson, which is the sort of, like... He's like the joke character. Like, he's the character that knows that nobody likes him. Like, the script kind of assumes that he's like a, a B character, even though he actually has a lot of time on the screen. Sa- Samson is one of those characters who, gun to my head, I would not be able to tell you if it was Jeff Bennett or Rob Paulson. It's Jeff Bennett. I know it's Jeff Bennett, because I'm looking at the wiki now, <laughs> oh, yeah. right now, but like, if I didn't know that going in, I... I would flip a coin and and fifty percent die. Yeah, <laughs> he was one of those characters that didn't wear pants, except for when he Meow. did. Yeah, yeah, uh, like in the pantsing episode. Yeah, or the um the alien episode. He was the one who got the the swim trunk snapping torture for like hours, which was interesting. Jeff Bennett also voiced uh, Commander Hoo Ha, who was pretty fun. Oh man! Yeah, because that was that was Bennett's opportunity in this show to be a screaming asshole. <laughs> uh, and then the 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 episode the episode where it's revealed that uh, Patsy is Huha's daughter is pretty is pretty hilarious. Just seeing him be the epitome and then some of the prototypical like I'm afraid of your dad, dad. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the protective dad. To the point where it's, like, scary and in the real world would probably be borderline, if not just abusive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I had like, I had that thought, like, re-watching this episode, like, like man, I'm way more aware of things. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how I felt when I was watching the show. Because, you know, there's the whole thing with, like, the girl camp and the boy camp and... Girls do this and boys do that, and this is gross. I feel like it was. I feel like it was a lot. But I, I mean, it I wasn't like, that bad. It no, was just kind of like I feel like a lot of it was couched in the idea that little kids are idiots. Like the thing with yeah. like sitting on like the bus, like the bus being divided into boy size and girl size. Like, oh yeah, that that was very much couched in. Yeah. This that, is fucking that was stupid. presented as like, hey, let's watch some kids have no logic. Yeah. yeah. And then also, like, half the time, half the time the Squirrel Scouts, you know, they liked doing regular kid stuff. You yeah, know, definitely. Especially out in the woods, like, playing in the, like, be, being proactive, doing, like, doing, like, physical things, playing in the mud. Just the whole fact that they had to have female counterparts, like, it's... Because well, I, I, I guess, like, that was just, like, the, that's, like, the, that's, like, the gendered camp setup. Yeah, there, I mean, that that's you know? the setting yeah. that you're going for. You can't, like... It wasn't, like, they're not co-ed camps. All right. The kids might smooch. <laughs> um yeah, all, all the ladies I always I always go to that when like people like talk about like oh you can't like you can't like take children like and like mix and like do a co ed like gender thing. I'm like I'm I'm just I'm just like what do you think they're gonna do? Fuck <laughs> They're like you they're ten fuck? You think these children are gonna fuck? <laughs> they could try get away with that. They won't be able to do it. They could try all night. <laughs> They won't <laughs> even figure it out, let alone be physically capable. Oh, uh, oh! <laughs> they won't even get to that point because they no. don't care. They'll. Here's the thing: they'll fall asleep. <laughs> they can't stay up too late. Half of the half of these children think the other gender has some sort of parasitic disease, and that's also your fault. <laughs> yeah, you know, pretty much. All the uh, lady types in this show are voiced by either Jody Benson or Jill Talley. Uh, Jody Benson is most famous for Ariel and Little Mermaid. Jill Talley was a uh, Karen on SpongeBob, the computer. Oh, wife. cool! And is also uh, Tom Kenny's wife. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yay. And she was a uh, Maja in Adventure Time, the Sky Witch. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Our lady counterparts are Patsy, Nina, and Gretchen. Um, Nina, the giraffe, was the first time I ever encountered a character in fiction that had my name. 
Were you, like, offended? I was just kind of like, what? I, I was like, are you, is it Mina? <laughs> like, I did the thing that people do with me when they don't know what my name is. But I, I don't know, that was just a personal fact. She's a fine character. Uh, it is not the most uncomfortable you've been seeing a character with your own name, Full Metal Alchemist! Yeah, that one kind of takes the case. It, wasn't that like, 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 weren't you one of those people who was legitimately traumatized by that episode? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I don't know if I was traumatized, but it was, at a time when I was learning about things that were good, <laughs> and I was trying to develop a taste, and I was just really taken aback by the quality of the the episode itself, just like the impact of it, it was just a very well written, well presented thing, and I was just like, "Oh man!" And it did not help that she had my name, which yeah. isn't a common thing for me. I know, Tooch, that happens to you all the time. You don't even <laughs> blink an eye anymore. Oh no! Like, I th- like I've, I-, I grew up being being like one of at least at the very least two like Michaels. My- in every Michael T. Classroom. Yeah I-, yeah, I was Nick B for like. All of ele- all of elementary and middle school. Well, it's, it's Michael M. That's right. <laughs> I forgot <laughs> your real last name. <laughs> what a dipshit! What a stupid asshole! I mean, I don't say it that often. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, it just took me a second. Like I'm an asshole for not realizing what you meant. I was like, "What the fuck does T stand for?" <laughs> <laughs> what is anybody <laughs> talking? Jesus Christ! Uh, um, but my favorite was Gretchen. Gretchen was a yeah, lot of fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, she was the best. <laughs> I actually liked Patsy a whole lot. Like, cause like it's I don't know, cause it's like sometimes she just seems like the prototypical like girl counterpart that has crush the main character, but then like I don't know when she wasn't doing that, she's really weird and like this little this little parkour child. I don't know. I liked her. Yeah, I love the Squirrel Scouts. I would have loved if summer camp was like that. I would have gone. And everybody was weird and they had cool stuff. And like the camp had been... a lot of money because that, that was part of yeah. the thing. They were also supposed to be the rich kids' camp. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They get like horses and like marshmallow machines and and the cheese festivals. Ah, cheese like if I was ten, I wouldn't appreciate a fancy cheese festival. You know what? Yeah, I did, I would not have appreciated cheese. I guess I would have learned. Yeah, at yeah. An early oh, you know age. what? Maybe that would have maybe that would have converted me way earlier <laughs> to the majesty of actual cheese. Yeah, but then you're like a twelve year old cheese aficionado, and everyone hates that kid. Everybody hates like a child. <laughs> <laughs> Who is a gourmet? It's <laughs> disgusting. I've never met one. But Nikki, Where that was kind of what we were. I mean, whenever we went to other people's houses, we were like, "What the fuck is this garbage whenever, you're trying to make we me went eat?" To eat at a pr- whenever we went to eat at a Protestant house and I had to suffer through their flavorless bullshit white people food, <laughs> I was like, "Why are these mashed potatoes so runny? I don't understand. Yeah, what is like, gravy?" Home, I love mashed potatoes, and then any any. To this day. No, that's not true. Well, no, at anybody's, like, house, I have never eaten good mashed potatoes except at my own house. They are always they always suck. There's, like, no goddamn flavor. Like, I've Yeah, we were those po- damn kids. Yeah. We hated everyone else's food. We're, like, gross. Everyone else's food, though, like, looking back this as This is an gross adult, and bad. You get... <laughs> looking back as an adult, everybody else's food was still objectively bad. And I blame Protestantism because that's what it was. <laughs> Yeah. We were the only Catholics, culturally Catholic, people who lived in our, wherever we lived. And so we were the only people who knew how to cook. Well, you know, th- that and the Italian and the Latin thing. Yeah, that's I mean, thing. Tooch, yeah. your Italian, is your food at home good and yummy? Oh, yeah. Um, well, my grandmother's food is. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I th- What I think it is, is that. It, it, well, it's wasps. It's not necessarily Protestant. Yeah, it's wasp food. If you're the whitest of the white, like, to the point where you can't even tell what level of German slash Irish slash <laughs> English you are, then your food isn't not going to taste good. Unless, bad. unless you have, like, a cool friend in college that gave you a couple recipes or something. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to take uh. down all sects of Protestantism because, like, Southern Baptist, you know. But again, 
the good food. I don't know co- anything about Protestantism. I'm not in a position but I'm saying, to talk but I'm about saying, it. Well, I'm talking about culinary wise. The good oh, food yeah. in like Southern, Southern Baptism like, is coming from food. non-white people mostly. Not not yeah. not all non-white people, but. Either it's either non-white people or white people who have stolen culinary culture from non-white people. Well, then. anyway, Camp Laszlo. <laughs> when is somebody gonna get f- so furious enough at me for what I say on this show to like kill me? <laughs> well, I don't know. How much do you at cut least out? When that happens, we'll know we finally made it. So the other ladies in camp, uh, the Squirrel Scouts. Um, we got the headmaster, uh, Miss Jane Doe, (laughs) who is, uh, Lumpus's love interest with her humble Minnesotan accent. Shrill ass Um, accent. (laughs) And, uh, Miss Mucus, who is also very hilarious, who is like the hard ass (laughs) assistant and... I can tell you that every year I've had gym class, there was always a Miss Mucus oh, yeah. female gym coach. There was always That's the hard ass one that you were like, you know, scared of. She was really fun to watch in this show, even though she was an antagonist a lot of the times, because she was such a pain in the ass. And, you know, and she just she just had a crazy hatred for Bean Scouts and was always trying to. Uh, dispose of them or kill them if it came to that yeah she just had no boundaries like she thought that they were just evil and garbage like telling the girls that, like oh they're gonna the cooties and they're gonna kill you and rah, 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 like spreading they're all trying to nonsense. give you their seed <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, she was Joe uh, Talley as well then there were some yeah. other ones that were uh, there mostly to fill space most recurring was yeah. uh, Almondine the owl but not much to her. Yeah, and there was a bunch of other characters here and there. There was Harold the Walrus. There was the French... <laughs> I like his voice. Yeah. There was the French lifeguards, a uh, bunch of random bean scouts in the background that had names, but it was always lampshaded that they were never given any attention. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. just existed. <laughs> um, there's a lot of twins. There's two sets of twins and then a set of quadruplets. Yeah, the Chip and Skip, Dave and Ping Pong, and the completely unnamed Lemming Brothers. Oh, no, they were named. Oh, yeah, Larry, Louie, Leonard, and Liniment, according to the Cartoon Network press kit. (laughs) Yeah, uh, Laszlo said a few of their names uh, at one point, yeah. Chip and Skip, I like, I mean, they're pretty standard, like, Patrick Star type characters, but the voice is just so good. Yeah, they have a really good voice. That's very funny. and, And they're two distinct voices. Yeah, one's a little higher pitched than the other one. And they're voices that, to me, very much encapsulate, like, the era that this show is, like, kind of calling back to of cartooning. Like, that's just the kind of, that's just the way cartoons sounded at that yeah. time. This was, like, because, like, this was, like, the swan song of that era of cartoons, I feel like. Like, that was one of the things that hit me really hard when I started watching it again. The swan song of stuff working off of the groundwork laid by Spongebob, or what? I guess, yeah, if Spongebob laid that groundwork. I just mean, like, you know, the whole, like, you have a cast of characters, and you just throw them into a scenario every episode, and by the end of it, the status quo is restored. But sometimes it's not, and then the next episode, every, the status quo is back for no reason. And yeah. It's like, it's, it's, less about, it's less about the story, and more about seeing these characters do shit. It's like, yeah. every episode is basically an improv skit set up. Yeah, pretty much. Like, yeah. time never passes. It doesn't really... You don't really think about those things or care about time. They're at camp, they're at camp for literally the entire summer instead of a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, there's a... Isn't there a Valentine's Day episode where they're at um, camp? No, that episode was just called... Uh, that episode was just called Valentine because Patsy gives him a Valentine, but it wasn't for Valentine's Day. But I, I, it probably aired around there, but they didn't actually say that it was Valentine's Day. Okay. And that... they had a Christmas in July episode, and then everybody went home for Halloween. So that means they literally wait until it's not even... It's barely summer anymore until they go home, and then it's immediately Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, cause I, while I was watching it, I made a tweet that, like, one of my favorite aesthetics from that era of cartooning is when the cartoonists have, like, backed themselves into a seasonal corner, but they still need to do holiday episodes, so they always really fucking stretch the concept and come up with stupid reasons for it 
to be celebrating that holiday in wherever they take place. Yeah. Or the, um Because they always do that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that came to a head, like a lot of these tropes came to a head with uh, Phineas and Ferb. Because uh, Phineas and Ferb was all about just deconstructing itself and everything that came before it. And then Gravity Falls did it after that. And, but it was really good because it was... The guy was no face, and I really like that episode. I like it yeah. too. Uh, apparently, uh, Martin Olson wrote for this show. He's the guy who he wrote for other stuff, including Rocco, and then went on to voice uh, Hunts and Abadir and write that Adventure Time encyclopedia. In character, nice. And he's a funny man. Like uh, Murray specifically went out and looked for him, and was like, "Dude, I need you to help me write this show. You're a funny. You're a funny man." I mean. I I mean, I don't know what else to really say other than it was cute and it filled up time and it made me smile as a child. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, overall, a solid show, worth checking out if you got it on hand. But uh, not something that really, I don't feel, blew anybody's mind or, or really uh, mixed up the industry or, or scene in any significant way. But, you know, certainly harmless and often funny. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Certainly harmless is such a weird, like, box quote. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, because um, a lot of people, um, <clears throat> especially since this is a post-90 show that hasn't gotten much, like, nostalgia buzz, if you ever, like, if you're one of those people that, like, remembers that this show was a thing, but it didn't leave a lasting impression on you, and you've been worried to go back to it because it might not be good, it's it's decent. It's good. It yeah. it, hel- it holds up. Yeah, if you want to exactly how you remember it being, I guarantee. Yeah, it is exactly how I remembered it was when I was a kid. That I can guarantee. Oh, but we also didn't mention the finale. Oh, the series finale, and I feel like that last season, just that last season in general, had a lot of wrap up stuff. Amazingly, yeah, I like uh, Laszlo and well, (laughs) well, uh, Jane Doe and Lumpus got married, but then they never really spoke of it again. Weird. Uh, Oh. wasn't there like some future predictions of who was going to end up with who or whatever? I, 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 I don't remember. I didn't watch every, I didn't watch all of them, but uh, probably, I assume so. Yeah, that sounds feasible. Uh, and then there was, and then there was an episode where like Edward overcomes his shitty older brothers, and then uh, the the very last episode starts off as a totally normal Laszlo episode where Lumpus comes up with some cockamamie scheme. Uh, that goes awry, but then, like, l- in the most non-sequitur ending ever, in, like, Monty Python fashion, the cops just show up and stop everything and go, like, you're not the real scoutmaster, this dude is, and, like, and, and like a naked, emaciated fucking heifer wolf from Rocco's Modern Life comes out of the cop car screaming about how this man stole his identity, and they never say it's heifer, but it's voiced by Tom Kenny, and uh, and and he, Lumpus calls him a cow, and then he corrects him, saying that he's a steer, which is was Heifer's thing. Mm-hmm. And um, and then he just goes off to jail, and the episode's over, and the series is over. I think Murray later said that uh, Doe bailed him out, but <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's Principal and the Popper meets the finale to Seinfeld, which yeah, man, oh. <laughs> It's also like Mano, it's Mano. children's fantasy. Like, man, what if the fucking principal just got arrested? Wouldn't that be great? So Wait, then I'd problems. be the principal. <laughs> but I feel like I feel like the the normal the normal a plot to the beginning of that episode is worth noting too, because Lumpus literally became world famous because he said, "Hey, laundry sucks. Let's <laughs> just paint clothing onto our bodies with paint." And then, like everybody got on board, and he and he became super famous until it rained. <laughs> this is the same yeah. episode. Yes. Yeah, this is the kind of show that Camp Laszlo is. Immediately, immediately after oh it my. rained, and everyone was standing there buck naked, he was arrested for identity theft. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. with that, I think we should move on. I agree. 